Hello everybody, welcome to Two Messianic Jews. This is the second video where I will be addressing claims made by Rabbi Michael Skoback that he makes in his video, Did Paul Invent Christianity? As I noted in the previous video, one of Rabbi Skoback's primary objections against Paul is his claim that Paul taught Jews to no longer be Torah observant. And in this presentation, one of his pieces of evidence for that is Acts 21. So first, I will share with you the clip where he makes this argument from Acts 21, and then I will respond to him in two phases. The first phase will be a quick read through the passage to show Acts 21 depicts Paul as a Torah-observant Jew, the exact opposite of what Rabbi Skoback describes. And then in the second phase, we will go much deeper than what is necessary to respond to Rabbi Skoback. First, I will answer a possible objection to how I read Acts 21, then I will spend the rest of the time reading through Acts 21 again, but this time going much deeper into details about the narrative structure of the chapter, the significance of things like Nazarite vows, and answering questions that naturally arise when reading through the passage. And all along the way, I will be sharing fascinating quotations from Christian and Jewish scholars that support my position. So pretty much if all you want is to see Rabbi Skoback's claims refuted, you just need to watch the first maybe 10-15 minutes. But if you want to hear a very close reading of Acts 21, please go ahead and listen to the whole thing. And thanks for joining me today. And so, okay, first, here is the clip of Rabbi Skoback making his argument. So it seems that the real problem, the real problem, is not that Paul is saying that Gentiles don't have to keep the Torah. That wouldn't be so incredibly controversial. It seems that the real problem was that Paul's real position is that no one needs to keep the Torah. And we see Paul being directly challenged on this in the book of Acts chapter 21, where James says to Paul, they've been told about you, Paul, they've been told about you that you were teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, meaning forsake the Torah of Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the traditions. So it seems that the real charge was that Paul was renouncing the importance and the the requirement of keeping the Torah even for Jews. For people who had been students of Jesus and heard throughout their walk with Jesus that you have to keep the Torah. This was an absolute scandal. All right, so Rabbi Skobek's main point is this. Acts 21 shows that Paul's real position is that no one needs to keep the Torah, and most significantly, not even Jews need to keep the Torah. Then he also says, For people who have been students of Jesus and heard throughout their walk with Jesus that you do have to keep the Torah, this was an absolute scandal. All right, so it's a bit unclear who Rabbi Skobek is referring to here as the students of Jesus. Is he talking about the thousands of Jewish followers of Jesus who are zealous for the law mentioned in this passage? Or is he just talking about James and the Jerusalem elders? Or is he talking about both groups? Rabbi Skobak doesn't give a clear indication of this, but this will be an important distinction when we read through the passage. All right, so let's just go ahead and jump right into it. As I read through this passage, I'll be reading a verse or two and then commenting on whatever I think is relevant before moving on to the next bit. So first, let's start with verse 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. All right, so let's already, let's go ahead and take a break here. And so first, we already have come across a clue that Rabbi Skobak is possibly misunderstanding the passage. Rabbi Skobak said that those in Jerusalem felt scandalized by what Paul was doing in preaching. But here we see that at least some of them received him gladly. It is unlikely that they would receive Paul gladly if they were displeased and felt scandalized by him. All right, let's continue on to verse 18. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. All right, so similar to uh, verse 17, this is the second indication that Rabbi Skobak is possibly misunderstanding this passage. If Rabbi Skoback includes James and the elders in the Students of Jesus group, then he thinks this passage shows that even they felt Paul's teaching among the Gentiles was an absolute scandal. But here, we see that Paul's ministry among the Gentiles caused James and the Jerusalem elders to glorify God. Again, this is not the kind of response we would expect of people who are deeply offended by Paul's teachings. 
In fact, this means James is very pleased and in agreement with whatever Paul was preaching among the Gentiles. So again, if Rabbi Skoback thinks James and the Jerusalem leaders felt scandalized, he likely is not noticing this feature of the passage. All right, so now moving on through verse 21. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. All right, so this is likely the verse that Rabbi Skobak is focusing on while possibly neglecting the hints that we just read. As we see, there were thousands of Jewish followers of Jesus who were zealous for the law and who had heard rumors about Paul that during his ministry to the Gentiles, he was telling Jews to forsake Moses, not to circumcise their children, or to walk according to Jewish customs. Verses 20 through 21 by themselves do not suggest one way or the other whether this is Paul's real position, as Rabbi Skobek suggests, so let's read the rest of the passage to find out if it is Paul's real position. All right, so returning to verse 22, we have James and the Jerusalem elders giving instructions to Paul, and they say this, What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. All right, and then a couple verses later, we find Paul helping these men complete their Nazarite vow, and he goes through a purification ritual as well. All right, so the key is right here. The rumor that Paul taught against circumcision and Torah observance for Jews is a false rumor about Paul. James knows this is an inaccurate description of Paul's real teaching. Rather than Rabbi Skobak's suggestion that Paul's real position is controversial, what was controversial in Acts 21 was that Jewish followers of Jesus wrongly thought Paul's position was what Rabbi Skobak described. The ones who did feel scandalized in Acts 21 are those who misunderstood Paul's real position. James and the Jerusalem elders knew Paul personally and knew this accusation against Paul was untrue. They knew Paul was Torah observant and never taught Jewish followers of Jesus to stop circumcising their children or observing the Torah. They were not scandalized. They were glad to see Paul. They rejoiced about his preaching among the Gentiles and guided Paul in how to best communicate to the masses that he himself remained a Torah observant Jew. We also find a direct refutation of Rabbi Skobak's possible claim that James and the Jerusalem elders were scandalized by Paul's teaching among the Gentiles. James and Paul are on the same page here. They both know that there is nothing to the rumors. Paul himself continues to, quote, live in observance of the law. So I'd like to share a quote with you from Dr. Jacob Gervell concerning this passage, and he says this, Luke depicts James as knowing both that the rumors are false and that Paul himself lives in obedience to the law. Consequently, Paul also teaches the Jews living in the diaspora to keep the law. The problem is only to get all those zealous for the law to perceive what James already knows and thereby to declare Paul's innocence. Paul's faithfulness to the law is demonstrated by the fact that Paul agreed to participating in a Nazarite vow at the suggestion of James. They both saw the Nazarite vow as a legitimate practice that would effectively communicate the truth that Paul himself remained Torah observant and never taught Jews to do otherwise. This passage Rabbi Skobek tries to use to support his claim that Paul taught against Torah for Jews demonstrates the exact opposite. Acts 21 shows that Paul remained Torah observant and never taught other Jews to stop. This was in complete harmony with James and the Jerusalem leaders. At the end of Rabbi Skobek's video, he mentions how he did what I think is a very important exercise that everyone should emulate. Here's the clip. Now, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't my personal religious bias that led me to this assessment of Paul. And so in order to check my math, what I did was look into the research of Islamic scholars on the same topic. And interestingly, what I found among Islamic scholars was basically the exact same assessment of how they viewed Paul's divergencies from Jesus. All right, so again, Rabbi Skobek is concluding a presentation that covered many more objections than what I've discussed so far today. I encourage you to watch his video because he offers what are many common objections about Paul and to go ahead and subscribe to Two Messian Jews because I will eventually be responding to all the claims he makes that need to be responded to in this video. 
Nonetheless, I think Rabbi Skobak sets a good example here in trying to find resources that represent uh, scholars from a diversity of backgrounds when doing research. This is something I try to do as well. I'm not sure if choosing Islamic scholars was the best way to test biases for this topic, because most modern Muslims believe that the New Testament we have today is corrupt, so it would be advantageous for them to claim Paul was inconsistent with the teachings of Jesus. That said, no scholar will be completely objective. But when it comes to Paul's view of Torah observance, Christian thinkers typically teach that Paul was against Torah observance, and Jewish scholars historically just agree with the Christian teaching because if Paul taught against Torah, they know they can just brush him to the side. But while I was conducting my research on Acts 21, I found many sources from Jewish and Christian scholars who come to what is stereotypically an unexpected conclusion. Here are a couple of really cool examples. Christian scholar Dr. David B. Wood says this, Thus even Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, agreed with James and all the elders on the importance of Jews keeping the law. Then we have the Jewish Annotated New Testament, which is a publication written by only non-Messianic Jewish scholars, and it says this, Acts emphasizes the harmony among early Christians, especially between Paul and the Jerusalem church leaders. Acts shows that Paul is scrupulous in his observance of Jewish law and Torah practices. And then, in his comments on Paul in Acts 21, 20-26, and Jesus in Matthew 5, 17-19, Orthodox Jewish scholar Dr. Michael Vishagrad, he says this, In short, neither Jesus nor Paul taught that any portion of the law of Moses had become outmoded for Jews. As is shown by the last two quotations by Jewish scholars, maybe Rabbi Skobak should consider leaning into some of his own Jewish biases which might enable him to see the very Jewish features of Paul and the rest of the New Testament. This is what is causing a major shift in Pauline studies. As more Jewish scholars examine Paul and the New Testament, the more the texts are being recognized as Jewish. All right, now I could stop here because Rabbi Skobak's use of Acts 21, I think, has sufficiently been dealt with, but I would like to take some time to explore further because this is such a crucial passage for Messianic Judaism. Before jumping back into the passage, let's first address a common objection to interpreting Acts 21 as showing a genuinely Torah-observant Paul. Many scholars attempt to explain Paul's behavior in Acts 21 by pointing to 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23, which says this, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews, to those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. The way this is typically interpreted is that Paul would behave like whoever he was trying to share the gospel with. When he wanted to share the gospel with a Jew, he acted like a Jew. If he wanted to share the gospel with a pagan, he acted like a pagan. So when scholars who think Paul was against Torah observance read Acts 21, one of the ways they attempt to explain Paul's behavior is by saying Paul was just acting like a Jew to appease the crowd. So there is a whole lot to sift through in this passage that I don't have time to talk about today. But for the sake of argument, let's just grant that the correct interpretation of 1 Corinthians 9 is that Paul would act like whoever he was trying to share the gospel with. Now, I don't think this is the right interpretation because of the work of two Jewish scholars, Messianic Jewish scholar Dr. David Rudolph and Reformed Jewish scholar Dr. Mark Nanos. I'll put a link to their work in the description for you to check it out. And I will also be making a video about this in the future, so subscribe to be notified when that comes out. But just for the sake of examining Acts 21 quickly, let's grant the traditional interpretation of 1 Corinthians 9. And so then the question becomes, even with the traditional interpretation, does 1 Corinthians 9 adequately explain Paul's behavior in Acts 21? Is it even a good argument with granting them their interpretation of the passage? I don't think so, because the situation in Acts 21 is entirely different than the situation proposed by the traditional interpretation of 1 Corinthians 9. Here are a few of the differences. First, under the traditional interpretation of 1 Corinthians 9, Paul became all things to all people to share the gospel with non-believing Jews and pagans. But Acts 21 is about clarifying Torah ethics for Jewish people who already follow Jesus and already believe the gospel. 
Second, the traditional interpretation of 1 Corinthians 9 suggests Paul changed his behavior for his conversation partner to be more receptive to the gospel message he is telling them. But in Acts 21, Paul's behavior is the message. There is no indication he stopped to speak with those upset with him. His participation in the Nazarite vow was his proclamation and communication of his message, that of being a Torah-observant Jew. And so these two passages are not analogous to each other. 1 Corinthians 9, the traditional interpretation, does not describe the situation that is occurring in Acts 21. The traditional interpretation of 1 Corinthians 9 simply does not explain Paul's behavior in Acts 21. And it becomes even more complex for those who use 1 Corinthians 9 in this manner when you bring in Acts 28:17. After three days, Paul called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. So first, there's no behavior involved here. Paul is making a truth claim. He says he had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers. Either he is lying or he is telling the truth. Messianic Jewish commentator Dr. David Stern says this, If Paul was not really Torah observant, if he really did teach the Jews in the diaspora not to have their children circumcised and not to follow the traditions, then he and James are exposed orchestrating a charade to deceive the Jewish believers zealous for the Torah into discounting the truth they had been told and believing a lie instead. Nothing in the whole New Testament justifies this understanding of how James, Paul, or any other believer functioned. And so the traditional interpretation of 1 Corinthians 9 cannot be used to explain Paul's claims to being Torah observant in Acts 21 or Acts 28. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, here's why Acts 21 is so important for Messianic Judaism. Remember, the three central claims of Messianic Judaism are 1. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. 2. Jewish followers in Jesus continued to have a covenantal responsibility to observe the Torah. This is not for eternal salvation, but to be obedient. And three, Gentile believers in Jesus do not have a covenantal responsibility to observe Torah. And as a side note, this third point is one of the major points of disagreement between Messianic Judaism and Hebrew roots or one law groups. Hebrew roots and one law groups do think Gentiles have an obligation to fully observe the Torah. They are making a grave error with this teaching. And this is something we will talk about much more on to Messianic Jews, but for now, let's just continue on with X21. And so I think we find support for both the second and the third claim in Acts 21, 17 through 26, as we read earlier. And so let's start again in verse 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. All right, so the first thing I think we should notice is the setting of what is taking place. This is in Jerusalem with James, with all of the elders, and I think this shows that what is about to happen is a really big deal. We are in the holiest city of Jerusalem, and as we read earlier, they will be at the holiest place, the temple, with James, the brother of the Messiah, and the leader of the Jerusalem congregation, and with all of the elders. Earlier in Acts 20, we learn that this is taking place around Shavuot, the feast where we celebrate God giving us the Torah, and all the Jews come to Jerusalem to observe the feast. These are all major players on the biggest stage at an important time to solve what is a major problem. Whatever happens next is highly significant. For more about this observation, check out Dr. David Rudolph's article, Luke's Portrait of Paul in Acts 21, 17 through 26. I'll put a link to his website in the description so you can find the article there. All right, so returning to the passage, we are in a holy place, and it's about holy people at a holy time to solve a major problem. So we really have to pay attention. So the next thing to notice is that there were thousands, or tens of thousands, depending on the translation, of Jewish followers of Jesus who were zealous for the Torah. Paul, James, and the elders considered the crowd 
to be members of the body of Messiah, and they were all still very passionate about observing the law. And at this point, we are decades past the resurrection of Yeshua. And so, again, commenting on this verse, Orthodox Jewish scholar Dr. Michael Vishagrad says this, I dare say that the early Jewish Christians were particularly devout followers of the law. For Vishagrad, this is due to the use of the phrase, zealous for the law. This phrase does not merely mean that these Jewish followers of Jesus observed the Torah. This means they passionately observed the Torah and were adamant about avoiding paganism. We get this from 1 Maccabees 2, where we see that for this author, zealous for the Torah meant even being willing to go to war. And so I'll read just a small selection from uh, that chapter, starting in verse 19. But Mattathias answered and said in a loud voice, Even if all the nations that live under the rule of the king obey him, and have chosen to obey his commandments, every one of them abandoning the religion of their ancestors, I and my sons and my brothers will continue to live by the covenant of our ancestors. Far be it from us to desert the law and the ordinances. We will not obey the king's words by turning aside from our religion to the right hand or to the left. When he had finished speaking these words, a Jew came forward in the sight of all to offer a sacrifice on the altar in Modin, according to the king's command. When Mattathias saw it, he burned with zeal, and his heart was stirred. He gave vent to righteous anger. He ran and killed him on the altar. At the same time, he killed the king's officer who was forcing them to sacrifice, and he tore down the altar. Thus he burned with zeal for the law, just as Phineas did against Zimri, son of Salu. Then Mattathias cried out in the town with a loud voice, saying, Let everyone who is zealous for the law and supports the covenant come out with me. Then he and his sons fled to the hills and left all that they had in the town. All right, so this is an extremely dramatic account of Mattathias, one zealous for the law, who killed a Jew who was about to conduct a pagan sacrifice, and then he killed the pagan officer who was forcing them to sacrifice. So first, obviously, there's no indication in Acts 21 that anyone's life is in danger, but this does explain why James and Paul really needed to clarify Paul's position as clearly and publicly as possible. These thousands of Jewish followers of Jesus, with an intense passion for Torah and protecting the covenant, thought one of the prominent leaders of the body of Messiah was leading Jews astray. Now, one might wonder why a teaching against circumcision would elicit such intense negative emotion. So it would help to understand the importance of circumcision for Jews. Circumcision is not merely an isolated commandment in the Torah. If Paul was teaching Jews to not circumcise their children, he would be teaching Jews to cut their children off from the covenant of Abraham. Genesis 17:14 says that any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. If Paul was teaching against this, or was even teaching it was just optional, it would cause him to fall under the apostate category in the minds of those zealous for the law. Neither of these teachings would satisfy the zealous Jewish followers or James and the Jerusalem elders. All right, so let's return to Acts 21, 22. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourselves along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. All right, so first let's take a look at the vows that are mentioned. There are most likely two types of vows under discussion here. The four men are under a Nazarite vow. This was a ceremony that Jews conducted when they made a special dedication to God and temporarily adopted additional Torah observances on top of what is typically expected of Jewish people. This included things like not shaving your hair, not drinking any wine, avoiding being in the presence of a corpse, and conducting a series of special offerings. You could see number six for more details about this. And shaving your head marked the end of the duration of the vow. So it is debated whether Paul was also under a Nazarite vow in Acts 21, or if he was just performing the necessary purification rituals to go into the temple and pay their expenses. But he did do what was likely a diaspora version of a Nazarite vow in Acts 18.18, 18, which says this. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Centria he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. Just like the four men in Acts 21, 
The mention of a haircut is a good indication that this was a Nazarite vow. Dr. David Rudolph highlights the significance of undertaking such a vow. He says this, The Nazarite vow was a voluntary act of piety, and the Jew who participated in this holy rite was seen as exceeding the maximum standards of the Torah. The Nazarite was also paradigmatic of Torah-observant Israel. But while Paul himself had performed a Nazarite vow previously, the focus in Acts 21 is that Paul was paying the expenses, likely paying for the sacrifices, for the four men to complete their Nazarite vow. So then the question is, how does this prove that Paul himself also lived in observance of the law, as James suggested? Dr. Bart Coet says this, By paying for the expenses of the sacrifices of those men, Paul associates himself with their law-abidingness. So the importance of this action is that Paul was publicly demonstrating that he aids and encourages Jewish followers of Yeshua to take Torah observance very seriously. This reflects his own personal commitment to Torah observance. So again, returning to Dr. David Rudolph, he says that the Nazarite vow was a special act of consecration, a way of expressing one's piety above and beyond the requirements of Mosaic law. In this regard, Paul's apparent Nazarite vow mentioned in passing in Acts 18.18 outside of Jerusalem, confirms James' view of Paul in Acts 21, for it indicates that Paul is even more than law-abiding. He is doing more than what is strictly necessary. Remember that this was happening at the temple during a major Jewish festival. Nazarites were very easily noticed due to their long hair, and thousands of Jews would have been present at the temple to see Paul help these men complete their vows. This would have been a very effective way to dispel the false rumors about Paul's teaching. So then the next question to ask is, how did this rumor start? How could so many Jewish followers of Jesus have thought Paul taught against the Torah? The answer may be more simple than you think. So Paul taught that Gentiles should not be circumcised, in other words, become Jews, and become expected to observe the whole Torah. This could easily become misconstrued as people went around town talking about it, and it eventually became a rumor that Paul was teaching this about Jews as well. Let's consider Galatians 5, 2 through 3. It says, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Messiah will be of no benefit to you. Again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to keep the whole Torah. All it would take is for someone to not hear, not remember, or neglect verse 3. To become under the impression that Paul was teaching only verse 2 to everybody, not just Gentiles. We know Paul was teaching this to just Gentiles because they were not yet circumcised. About this question, Dr. Rudolph says this, From a narrative point of view, it is not difficult to see how a misunderstanding about Paul's intended audience in Galatians 5.2, or a deliberate distortion of his words by his critics, could have led to the false rumor in Acts 21.21. Galatians 5.2 is but one of many Pauline texts that could have been misrepresented by Paul's opponents to depict him as an apostate Jew. Orthodox Jewish scholar again, Dr. Michael Vishagrad, makes a similar observation. He says, In any case, because Paul preached against circumcision and the law for Gentiles and clearly came into conflict with the Jewish Christians who believe that circumcision and the law was essential for Gentiles also, it is easy to imagine how this position could have generated the mistaken or perhaps willful misinterpretation that Paul was preaching against circumcision for Jews as well as Gentiles. But the fact remains that this is not what he believed or preached. Christian scholar Dr. David B. Wood says, Often overlooked is the question of how the rumor arose, especially since Luke recorded nothing to indicate any truth of it. The answer is surely that Paul taught Gentiles not to take on the law not to circumcise their children, and not to live according to Jewish customs. This would be in keeping with the ruling of the Jerusalem Council, and is implicitly confirmed in 16.4. As Paul taught in synagogues in the Diaspora, it would be no surprise if Jews deliberately or accidentally recounted his instructions to the Gentiles as though he had issued them to Jews. Another important point to note in 21.21 is that the elders expressed no concern that Paul was instructing Gentiles not to keep the law. In this, we see both that they made a distinction between Jewish and Gentile believers in Jesus regarding their obligation to the law, and that they did not require Gentile believers to observe it. All right, so in verses 22 through 24, 
we learn that Paul was conducting in an effective way to demonstrate to the masses that he himself remained faithful to Torah. An explanation for why this rumor arose in the first place is that Paul taught Gentiles not to become Jews, and this evolved into a misrepresentation of Paul's perspective on Torah observance for Jews. This will be explored a bit further as we discuss the next verse in this passage. So let's move on to verse 25. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Alright, so this is really important. Here James is recalling the ruling of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, where Peter, James, Paul, and the rest of the leaders, by the authority of the Holy Spirit, came to the decision that Gentiles did not have to be circumcised and did not have to observe the whole Torah to become members of the Jesus-following community. As a side note, Acts 15 is a major issue when it comes to the Hebrew Roots Movement. Many in the Hebrew Roots Movement believe Acts 15, specifically verse 21, implies that Gentile followers of Jesus are obligated to observe the whole Torah, which includes what is commanded uniquely to Israel, such as circumcision, kosher law, Shabbat, and the feasts. Of course, this is where we as Messianic Jews and Messianic Gentiles would differ from the Hebrew Roots Movement, but I will be making an epic video addressing Acts 15 specifically and in a lot of depth in the future, so subscribe and hit the notification bell to be updated whenever that video comes out. But for now, I will just share some quotes from scholars about why the Acts 15 decree is being repeated in Acts 21, which is about Paul's Torah observance. About Acts 15 and Acts 21, Dr. Matthew Thiessen says, While both Paul and the Jerusalem Assembly believe that Jews ought to continue in their observance of the law, both agree that Gentiles should not, a decision of the Jerusalem Council that Luke reiterates here. Not only does God not require Jewish Christ followers to abandon law observance, he actually requires them to continue in law observance. And by Gentiles should not observe the law, Thesen means Gentiles should not be circumcised and becoming responsible for being fully Torah observant. And then Dr. Dave Rudolph says, James anticipates Paul's concern that such a public demonstration may be misinterpreted by Gentile believers to mean that they too should be Torah observant. He reassures Paul that the Gentile believers will not misunderstand because of the decree they had already received. Here James restates the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council decision that exempted Jesus-believing Gentiles from circumcision and other Jewish-specific requirements of the Torah. James parallels the necessity of the Jews keeping the law with the necessity of Gentiles to keep the apostolic decree. So, verse 25 is a reminder to Paul and the reader that Gentile followers will not take Paul's actions to mean that they should also be fully Torah observant because of the apostolic decree decided in Acts 15. Alright, so now moving on to verse 26. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them, and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled, and the offering presented for each one of them. Alright, so that is the end of the passage, and here is how Jewish scholar Dr. Isaac Oliver summarizes Acts 21, 17 through 26. He says, To dispel the rumors about Paul's apostasy, James, the brother of Jesus, advises Paul to assist and accompany some Torah-observant Jewish followers of Jesus in their ritual purification at the temple. The Paul of Acts readily complies, affirming in this concrete and public way the value of preserving and transmitting Jewish identity. The apostolic decree, with its four stipulations given to Gentile Christians, also clearly presumes, from the point of view of Acts, that Jewish followers of Jesus will continue to observe the Torah in total. Jewish followers of Jesus continue observing all of their ancestral customs, while Gentiles observe a minimal set of Mosaic requirements. So there is some stark language used by some of these scholars about how Gentiles observing Torah may be making some Messianic Gentiles a little uncomfortable, but as I discuss in our video, A Case for Messianic Judaism, Gentile followers of Jesus are free to express their faith in a Jewish way within a Messianic congregation with the proper understanding and motivations as to why they are doing so. In fact, Acts 15 is one piece of evidence that Gentiles are welcome to worship in the synagogue, but please see A Case for Messianic Judaism for a little bit of a more detailed explanation. But again, this is a topic that we will continue to explore repeatedly on this channel, so please subscribe to join us. Alright, so there it is. 
Contrary to Rabbi Skoback, I think Acts 21 shows us very clearly that Paul genuinely remained a fervent and faithful Torah observant Jew. If you disagree or would like to add anything, I would love to hear about it. Please leave a comment or email us at twomessianicjews at gmail.com. To be notified for upcoming podcast episodes, please click subscribe. If you're on YouTube, click subscribe and the notification bell to be notified when we post a video. I look forward to hearing from all of you. This is a very important topic. I'd love to hear some feedback. Thanks for exploring Acts 21 with me today. I'll see you next time.